<gasps> Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is the worst game I've played since Fetch with my son. Bring the ball back, asshole! Look, this game isn't all bad. There's actually a lot of stuff I really like about it. And you can tell from the review scores that I'm pretty sure I'm in the minority here. But despite playing and liking both Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade X, and RPGs literally being my favorite genre of video game, I straight up did not have a good time with Xenoblade 2. But I'm not even saying that it's all bad. It's not even the worst sequel I've ever played. Tales of Symphonia 2 is the worst sequel I've ever played. To summarize my opinion of the game right at the start of the video, which is gonna be great for watch time, all the stuff it does well, it got from the previous two games. Which is fine. If you did it well the first time, do it well the next time, you know? But all the stuff unique to Xenoblade 2, I personally found were steps backwards in terms of scope and quality, or were just bad base level game design decisions. But other people really like the stuff I personally hate about it, and that's totally fine. Snack and Gamer is uh, currently unavailable, but if I had to phrase it the way that he would, I'd say that, to me, this game is like trail mix. I'm indifferent on sunflower seeds, but M&Ms are literally my favorite type of candy, and I love peanuts, I love having them salty nuts in my mouth, but I can't stand raisins! I fucking hate raisins! I hate raisins! I can't eat trail mix because they ruin the entire experience for me. You can't ignore the raisins. Raisins are core to the trail mix experience, so I don't eat trail mix because I can't fucking stand the raisins! Xenoblade 2 is trail mix with extra raisins. The negatives outweigh the positives and ruin the entire experience for me. Other people like raisins, so they like trail mix, and that's fine, but I don't have shit taste. And I really don't want this video to be one of those thing you like is bad, here's why videos we all see and I recommended. And this isn't trying to be a quote unquote objective review either. This is literally just why I personally don't like the game. However, titling this video, my nuanced opinion about why my personal taste led me to have a negative experience with Xenoblade 2 is too long of a title and not nearly as clickbaity enough as why this game sucks. And I'm not trying to change your mind if you like this game. If anything, I'm jealous of you. I got the game the day it came out. Xenoblade Chronicles 1 is literally my third favorite game of all time, and this is its direct sequel. I even pre-ordered Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Pro Controller, which doesn't even work anymore. Pretty fitting of the game's overall quality, I'll give it that much. But I really wanted to like the game. Even though leading up to its release, it didn't look that great. The release. The first look we got of this game was in January 2017 at the Nintendo Switch first look presentation. They showed off the trailer and before even showing the title, it just looked super generic. Oh wow, a boy wearing a dumb outfit, a world tree, a half-naked anime girl, a magic sword. Next you're gonna tell me there's an angsty antagonist in a secretly evil church. This is one of the most generic looking games I've ever seen, oh my god, what the fuck? They had a couple more trailers throughout the year, and they didn't really make the game look that much better. Granted, I wasn't really paying that close attention to the trailers, since I know that Xenoblade games have a lot of twists and turns to their stories and won't be super predictable. The mentor character died? What? And it wasn't until they had a specific Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Direct where they showed off the features of the game. You know, this game, this game doesn't look too bad. Besides, it's a Xenoblade game. They're all good, so I'm sure this game's gonna be great, right? 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 And so what if the main character has a stupid looking outfit? You can change the outfits in Xenoblade games. They have tons of visual character customization options. I bet within the first hour of the game, you're gonna get to change into something else. They wouldn't release a new Xenoblade game where you're stuck looking at the dumbest fucking video game outfit of all time, right? 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 Honestly, if this game wasn't called Xenoblade Chronicles 2, then I probably wouldn't have played it. Based off of the surface level qualities alone, if this game was called something stupid like, I don't know, Genshin Impact, then I wouldn't have even given it a second look. 
but I can't see a direct sequel to one of my favorite games of all time and not check it out, you know? So I pre-ordered the game, got it on launch day, beat it in about a month or two, and uh, let me tell you, straight up didn't have a good time. I did not like the characters. I did not like the story. I did not like the gameplay. I did not like the battle system. I did not like the gacha game system that ruins every other system in the game that interacts with! But then I went online and saw mostly positive reviews and like people like loving the characters and loving the story and crying at its ending. And I, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! And I was just like, did we play the same game? Oh, well, that explains it. I've been playing ARMS this whole time. So after deciding to make this review, I eventually did replay the game in late 2019. It nearly killed me. Mostly just to get footage for this video, so I did play through the game fairly quickly. And to the game's credit, there have been numerous quality of life updates that have come out since I'd finished the game, so I will say that in my second playthrough, I liked it more. Or more accurately, I disliked it less. Like, I don't like to do numerical reviews of games, or really any art in general, but if I had to put things on a scale for comparison, on a scale of zero being, oh, this game's garbage, five being, it's, it's alright, and then ten being, it's a masterpiece, everyone's gotta play it. I give Xenoblade Chronicles 1 a 10 out of 10, it's a masterpiece, everybody should play it. I give Xenoblade Chronicles X a 9.5 out of 10, it's really, really good. In my first playthrough of Xenoblade 2, I'd give it like a... Like a 3 out of 10. And in my second playthrough, I, 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 I bumped that up to like a 4, 4.5. So still negative, but you know, not as bad. I do think that's original release, the game was very rushed and understaffed. Largely because during the time of its development, its developer, Monolith Soft, was split. Half of them working on this game, half of them working on this small little indie title I'm not sure if many of you have heard of called Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, one of the best games of all time. And I'm sure they were under pressure to get this game out in the first year of the Switch. We all thought it was going to get delayed and it still came out in December 2017. And based off all the no-brainer quality of life improvements that came out later, yeah, it probably should have been delayed. There was just a serious lack of polish. But in this review, I'm going to talk about the game as if you were playing it today. I will mention the stuff that was wrong with it in my first playthrough, but I'm not going to harp on it if they fix it later. And I'm going to be using the previous game as a point of reference for a lot of cases. Not saying that every game in a series should have as big of a scope or scale as a previous game. However, I don't think that games in the same series should vary wildly in quality. Paper Mario. These are more so examples of, here's how they did it well in the previous two games, and here's how they fucked it up in the sequel. So let's take a look at the game right from the start, shall we? The beginning of the game. Also spoilers for literally the entire game, but honestly, you're not missing much. Also mild spoilers for Xenoblade 1 and X, but I'll keep it as vague as possible. For reference, Xenoblade 1 starts with an overview of its setting, and then zooms into a battle establishing its central conflict, people versus the machines. It's a good way of establishing the tone, setting, and central conflict of the game. It's also a good way to get the player's attention right from the start, while also informing them of information that all the characters in the story already know. Xenoblade X starts with humanity abandoning the Earth while it gets blowed up and journeying out into space looking for a new place to live and fighting for survival against hostile aliens, thus establishing the setting of the story, the tone of the story, and its central conflict. Xenoblade 2 <sighs> does the same thing, but not really in a good way. You watch a whale die while Rex, the main character, does menial tasks. While he wears the worst outfit in JRPG history, what the fuck were they thinking? And the game establishes that, sort of similar to the first game, you live on the backs of big animals, and the big animals live in a sea of clouds. And then Rex fights a crab, and the world is very slowly dying. And Rex does a voiceover where he tells you the legend of a place where there might be enough place for everyone to live on instead of dying in the cloud sea, I guess. Not every game needs to have a bombastic opening to get the player's attention and hook the player in right from the start, you know? Final Fantasy VI is the best Final Fantasy and starts with you just walking through some snow while the credits play. But then again, at the time, this was considered a huge graphical flex. My favorite game of all time, Chrono Trigger, starts with you walking around a fair. But even then, you meet some characters, do a combat tutorial, play some mini games, and it hooks you into liking the characters right from the start, via their charming personality. And when one of those characters goes missing right at the start, the player is just like, oh, I gotta find him. But in Xenoblade 2, you just have Rex talking to his dragon grandpa about information they both already know. At least the music's really good. But then a monster shows up and the combat starts. I'll go way more in depth in the combat system in this video later, but just know for now that a 
unlike in the previous Xenoblade games that A, you can't move and auto attack, and B, your arts, which are your special moves, charge up via auto attacks. So in the first battle, while the really good battle music plays, you don't press a single button to move the control stick at all, and instead just sit there and watch Rex slowly attack, and then while his arts charge up, you press the corresponding button, then go back to watching the battle. The game explains all this to you in not one, not two, but four separate tutorials that are all text. These qualities of the combat system were immediate red flags for me, but it'll just take some getting used to, right? 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 Rex arrives at our Jedi Trade Guild, and you read a lot of tutorials and watch a lot of cutscenes and talk to multiple no pawn in a row. So, here, 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 and here, I already have problems with the game. First of all, Tell, don't show. Isn't it supposed to be show, don't tell? Why, yes, it is supposed to be show, don't tell. At multiple points during the game, including during the beginning, the characters will give you descriptions of things important to the story, but they don't have visuals that make what they're talking about easy to understand. Unlike in the previous games where, for example, in Xenoblade 1, they would talk about the Bionis and Mikans fighting, which is central to the plot, and will show that battle happening on screen, or how in Xenoblade X, they'll talk about aliens attacking Earth, and show the aliens attacking the Earth, Xenoblade 2 glosses over a lot of important exposition while still expecting you to care about what's going on. The player having a foundational knowledge of exposition that all the characters in the story know is key to having the player both understand and get invested in the story. Rex and Azurda are talking about important exposition that they both already know, but they're not showing any of it on screen. In a video game, an inherently visual medium. They're just saying a lot of proper nouns out of context. Which brings me to the second problem. This game introduces a lot of proper nouns right at the start, way too quickly, and doesn't really define a lot of them. All rest, the architect, Elysium, the Titans, Fonset Village, World Tree. The Argentum Trade Guild, Or Arday, and Uriah, Papune, Leftherian Archipelago, Chairman Banner, Drivers, and Blades. Jin, Dromark, Malos, Zarts, the Maelstrom, that's the Aegis, or the Monoceros, is that a core crystal? The Aegis is driver! It's all very front-loaded. You have NPCs yelling exposition at you as you walk by. Everything has a real weird name that does not help in understanding what it is at all. And it doesn't help that the music is going fucking bananas! I'm still trying to figure out what the fuck a Morar Dane is. Meanwhile, the background is going better to better to better to better to dig it, dig it! While the music does fit the hustle and bustle of a trade guild, it's not very conducive to learning. It would be nice if there was an in-game glossary or reference guide to look up what things are. But if you're playing this on the day it came out like I did, there's no online wiki or anything, so you better learn which one the blade is and which one the driver is now. And speaking of learning, third, there are way too many tutorials, and all the tutorials suck. I feel like it's an overcorrection from Xenoblade X, since a lot of people criticize that game for A, not having enough tutorials on a lot of the game's deeper systems, and B, having font that was way too small. So instead, in Xenoblade 2, you have tutorials every 10 seconds, and the font covers a third of the screen. Which wouldn't be so bad. Obviously, you want the player to learn how to play the game. But these tutorials are terrible. They're a perfect example of exactly what not to do. Unlike in, for example, Astral Chain, you know, a good game, where there are quick videos showing you exactly how to do things and you can rewatch them at any time, or even in the previous Xenoblade games where there are pictures and diagrams of how to do stuff. In Xenoblade 2, it's all text, and I hope you like reading because you only get one chance to retain all of this. And it'll talk about where things are located in menus, but won't show you where in the menu it is. It just gives you a file directory like it's a Microsoft Office, and you're not gonna remember as soon as the tutorial's done. Look at a game like Tales of Vesperia, where they show you where in the game the menu things are. And not only that, the game treats you like you've never played a video game before, and constantly interrupts you to tell you about the most basic features. Here's how you move the camera. This is what a mini-map is. The sun icon on screen means that it's daytime. Are you kidding me? This is a teen rated 70 hour JRPG and it has two in its title. This is no one's first video game. And even if it was, I'm pretty sure they can figure out on their own that the sun next to the time of day means that it's daytime. If your tutorials are bad, then don't have so many. If you're gonna have a lot of tutorials, make them good. You shouldn't have a lot of tutorials and then also have them all be bad. 
You know what a good tutorial would be? Teaching the player something and then giving them a chance to practice it. Such as quickly teaching them the combat fundamentals and then giving them a stretch of land to practice it in. Like, I don't know, the previous two games had. Something you probably shouldn't do is, I don't know, teach them some of the combat in one fight and then have them watch 30 minutes of bad cutscenes and having a bunch of tutorials on a bunch of other useless stuff. Fourth, this is just a boring and unfitting way to start a game. In the first hour, you're just running errands, having way too many characters introduced all at once, watching slow-paced, awkwardly voiced cutscenes, and having exposition poorly dumped on you. Now you may be thinking, but Mr. Spaceman, a lot of games start out not so great, but eventually get good. You even said before you didn't like the first couple hours of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, and it took a while for the game to get good. But for Xenoblade 2, these aren't just nitpicks exclusive to the beginning of the game. These issues at the start are a microcosm of what the entire game is like, where it cares more about telling its story in its own way, rather than focusing on the player having a good interactive experience. From an audience perspective, this might seem alright to say and watch. And honestly, the best way to experience Xenoblade 2 is to go on YouTube, watch all the cutscenes, and not actually play the game. But from a player perspective, it sucks to play through. You ever heard of In Medius Res? You know, trim the fat and start the story at an interesting point to immediately hook the player? Maybe have all this stuff beforehand serve as a quick flashback or something. Again, not every game needs to have some hype opening. You can have more subdued openings and be effective, but that direction doesn't really fit Xenoblade 2's wacky tone. Speaking of wacky tones, fifth, the English dub. No wait, I'm sorry. The English dub? On my first playthrough of Xenoblade 2, I kept an open mind about everything until a cutscene where Rex meets Nia, Jin, and Malice for the first time. And I don't really like to use the word cringy, and I have not played every video game, but I have played a lot of video games. And this was quite possibly one of the cringiest cutscenes I've ever seen in my entire life. for accepting summons. I, Banna, chairman of Argentum Trade Guild. P pleased to make your acquaintance. I'll do it. I hereby swear to use every skill I possess to ensure this job is successful. I promise I won't let you down. <laughs> Drivers and blades. Whoa, they look so cool. Banner have stroke of genius. Should hire Rex. Ha <laughs> ha, you made the right choice. Jin, don't tell me we're going to have to hire some babysitters for this outing too. What the hell? You look as much like a kid as I do, lady. It should be easy enough to make sure. What? Where'd you learn those arts? Grump showed me a thing or two. Even when I was little. That was his idea of playtime. What? How did the giant quadruped dragon teach him how to use a sword? You have to explain this. Mad, mad, mad! I'm sure a lot of people will boil this down to bad voice acting, but I think that instead it's more of a lack of good voice direction. When they record their lines, the actors had no context for anything that they were saying. So all things considered, I think the actors are actually doing a pretty good job. A lot of the problem with the English dub comes from that a lot of the voices don't match the characters. On one hand, it's great that voices that aren't traditionally cast as main characters have starring roles. But more so than in the previous two Xenoblade games, these are super anime-ass looking characters. Their eye to face ratio is off the charts. And if you close your eyes and listen to the cutscenes, it sounds fine. And if you mute the game and look at it, it looks fine. But when you combine these very thick British Isle accents with these huge uwu eyes of all these characters, and body animations that rarely match the line delivery, it's very jarring. Every time the characters speak, it creates this sense of cognitive dissonance that makes me go, This don't match that! I remember now. That bastard stabbed me! Oh man! This is bad! Everyone in the guild is in danger! No, wait! I can't do anything if I'm dead! Titan's 
Fuck. If I wasn't dead, I'd kick that guy's ass. It has the quality of like a 90s anime, but then you have to be reminded this was made in 2017. Xenoblade 1 had one of the greatest English dubs of all time, and it came out seven years beforehand. Also in a lot of the cutscenes, there's oddly no music, so the pauses between lines of dialogue are even more apparent, and the dialogue-heavy in-engine cutscenes are very stiff. It's just like, move, speak, line, and emote, move. You see what I mean? They're not very fluid. And not to mention, many of the voices and writing is very annoying. This game is full of bands. Very annoying Nopon. Like, do people actually like Nopon? A brief history of Nopon. Xenoblade 1, there was one section of the game full of Nopon who speak with ridiculous voices, but most of them didn't have major speaking roles, with the exception of Ricky, who joined you at the same time as Melia as a quote-unquote comic relief character. And he was kind of annoying and completely derailed the tone of the story where he was Jaws of Life inserted into the party. So for my first time ever playing, I benched him for a good chunk of the game. It wasn't until one of the slower cutscenes where he talked with Dumban about being a dad, and I was like, you you know what, Ricky? You're not so bad. And I put him in the party and, and, he, and he grew on me over time. Ricky, the one good Nopon. Xenoblade X. There's one main Nopon in this game, Tatsu, and he sucks. Holy fuck, the game would be so much better if he just wasn't in it. He's a non-playable party member and he talks in a very annoying way and he never shuts the hell up. He has zero redeeming qualities. They make the same joke over and over again about mistaking him for a potato and threatening to cook him and he's the worst part of the entire game. Fuck Tatsu, all my homies hate Tatsu. Xenoblade 2, there are so many. God damn no pun in this game, oh my god. More vans here than a Walmart park lot after fucking soccer practice. And so many of them have speaking roles and they're written to be so annoying. This is bad writing. Lukewarm take. Nopon are the worst part of all three Xenoblade games. Torn of the Golden Country prequel DLC. Zero Nopon with major speaking roles. Good. Xenoblade Definitive Edition Future Connected. The side story gives you two more Nopon to control. Oh boy! Nene is pretty alright though. Kino is very forgettable and I benched him for most of the game. Screw having a healer. And I'm sure many people have already written in the comments, If you don't like the English dub, just play it in Japanese. I shouldn't have to play it in Japanese. The game was officially released in English in 2017 and the dub is terrible. Some parts of it sound like a fan dub, not that of an officially released full price product. This game has 14 hours of fully voiced cutscenes, and that's just the main story. There's also fully voiced side quest dialogue and fully voiced heart to hearts, not to mention all the battle dialogue, which oh boy, I'll get to you later. With all this dialogue in a story focused game and a reputation of having good quality English voiceover from your previous games, why would you skimp on the localization? Every character has multiple lines where the voice director should have been like, hmm, maybe do another take on that one, but because I assume the game was so rushed, they didn't have time to do another take. It's good enough, ship it. And speaking of annoying sounds, 6. Rex. The main protagonist of this story is Rex. He sucks. The story of a nothing child salvager who becomes the driver of the Aegis, the most powerful blade of all time, would be an interesting story to watch. But in a video game, you can't forget that the character you control serves as an audience stand-in. They're an extension of the player. And I'm not sure how many people would actively want to play as Rex. I feel like when they designed him, they wanted him to be a cross between Sora from Kingdom Hearts, a game with a really great story, <coughs> and Lloyd from Tales of Symphonia. What is that? Swim like a fish and drink like one too. That's the salvages code. War of law number two. Never abandon someone in need. Always help those who help you. That's the second rule of the salvages code. Dwarven vow number seven. Justice and love will always win. Oh, I hate that saying. And the cognitive dissonance between appearance and voice is definitely strongest with Rex. I was hoping that over the course of the game I would get used to it, and it just didn't happen. And I've not played every game, but I have played a lot of games, and visually, this is the dumbest outfit I've ever seen for a video game protagonist in my entire life. And I played Fire Emblem Three Houses. Holy shit, why was this the final design? Who looked at this and said, Oh yeah, it looks great, especially for the main character, ship it. What? Everything about it is terrible. From the deep v-neck to the short sleeveless jacket to the Kingdom Hearts belt to the cropped onesie under his clothing to the bowed out knees to the oddly large rusty Mickey Mouse shoes to his five foot 
who height, it looks like shit. Now that's a character people are gonna wanna play as for a hundred hours. And yeah, he gets a new outfit two thirds of the way through the game, which I will admit is an improvement, but it still retains all the same negative aspects of his original design, it's just a brighter color palette. And a weird, dumb visual design is one thing, but his personality sucks? He's written as a child, and I find children incredibly annoying, and Rex is no exception. In the story, he's never responsible for his own actions, and doesn't feel like he grows for them, he just cries and whines and gets his way. There's nothing wrong with the man crying. But Rex is written almost like he's a rich kid who constantly messes up, but still triumphs because someone else bails him out and he doesn't grow from it. Many examples incoming. He gets killed by Jin, Rex throws a temper tantrum, Pyra immediately revives him. His actions and irresponsibility lead to his surrogate grandfather father dying, Rex cries, and Azurda immediately regenerates himself. Vandom dies fighting Malice and Akos, and instead of Rex retreating, even though he's clearly outclassed, he continues fighting, risking both his own life, Pyra's life, the rest of his party's life, wasting Vandom's sacrifice, and Mithra just has to awaken and bail him out in the end. More than halfway through the game, Pyra sacrifices herself to the bad guy so the party can escape. What does Rex do? He cries for two days, gives up on the party, and tries to abandon everyone else, and lets Pyra get tortured by the enemy. This is the guy people are begging for in Smash Brothers? Are you kidding me? Oh, and then rather than finding a solution to the problem on his own, the ghost of the main character from the prequel DLC says, Oh, well, I wasn't worthy of Mithra's true power, but I guess you are, even though the evidence does not back you up on this at all. And then Rex becomes the master driver, clearly worthy of controlling every blade. At the very end of the game, Pyra has to sacrifice herself so the rest of the party can escape to safety, but don't worry, Rex cries a bunch so both her and Mithra are immediately revived, and they're both in love with you, and Nia's in love with you, and Morag respects you, and Zeke respects you, and Tor looks up to you. What the fuck? Rex is a static character throughout pretty much the whole game, doesn't really change or grow, he just wings it, never fully taking responsibility for the massive power that Pyra allegedly has, and never taking the initiative in the plot. Despite becoming the master driver, Rex doesn't drive the plot, the plot drives him. Okay, okay, I get it. I'm a terrible disappointment. You got that right. I can understand wanting to do something different from Shulk, the protagonist from the first Xenoblade game, but that doesn't mean you should do the exact opposite of a good character. Because you're going to end up with a bad character. Shulk was really smart. Let's make Rex really fucking stupid. Shulk thinks about the implications of his actions. Rex just rushes in head first. Shulk thinks about the weight of his power and responsibility. Rex couldn't give two shits. Choke has to triumph through adversity, Rex cries and gets his way. The story closely follows the characters, so if you don't like the characters, in this case specifically the male lead, who the average player will be playing as for the majority of the game, it's really hard to get into the story, at least for me. But it's not so bad, right? After going through a formerly sunken ship, you meet the female lead of the game, Pyra, who- JESUS CHRIST! LOOK AT THE SIZE OF THOSE THINGS! The over-sexualized design of the female lead. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like big titties as much as the next guy, but this is ridiculous! That's how the game should have opened up. The land of Orest is home to many titans of great size. More Ardain, Oriya, Gormat, and Pyra's titanic bazungas. This is like the way that fan art would be drawn, not the actual official design. Yep, we've reached the part of the series where I talk about women's bodies for way too long. And I'm not saying real women with this body type don't exist. I looked for a long time just to make sure. Like a long time. Like a really long time. I'm saying they could have given her any body type and they just so happened to give her boobs bigger than her fucking head. When's the last time she's seen her own stomach? They could have performed Cole's historically inaccurate plays on that balcony. I'm just clowning, big titties is whatever. But her outfit is ridiculous. You know, there's a difference between sexy designs and over-sexualized designs, but I think we can all agree that this falls squarely into the over-sexualized zone. Her chest is like this fucking vacuum sealed shrink wrapped shirt. The rest of her, uh, top? is basically an arrow pointing at her chest with a landing strip of lights that stop right at her nipples, completely backless top, tight straps on her hips, thong on the outside, and booty shorts two sizes too small that have her ass cheeks hanging out in half the cutscenes. 
Video games don't exist in a vacuum, and this game knows exactly what it's doing too. There are so many pervy camera angles in this game, and not just of Pyra, but many of the female characters. It's ridiculous! Who's the horny on main cutscene cinematographer that was in charge of the staging? There are more ass shots in this game than Final Fantasy X! When I think of how I feel when I play the other two Xenoblade games, a lot of adjectives come to mind, but skeevy isn't one of them. I used to bring my Switch into work with me and play games on my lunch break, but when I was playing Xenoblade 2 I thought, you know, uh, maybe I should leave this one at home. I don't want someone to casually walk by and see, uh, this? When did this become Xenoblade? I mean sure, this is only the third Xenoblade game in this series, but if in Zelda 1, Zelda looked like this, in Zelda 2 she looked like this, and in Link to the Past she looked like this? You'd be like, whoa, 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 what's, what's going on here? Usually if you're gonna have a design like this on one of the main characters, you usually would provide some type of a reason for it. Like if you're gonna objectify women in your game, at least pretend to have an excuse. This is just lazy. There's no reason given for it, and it doesn't fit her personality at all. For example, I like the Bayonetta series, even though for her strongest attacks all her clothes come off, but it fits her personality. Bayo is a strong, confident, dominatrix witch. She owns her sexuality. The agency of it lies with her. And it's all done in a very tongue-in-cheek way. In Xenoblade, Pyra has the personality of a glass of water and is supposed to be taken seriously in this game while wearing the most ridiculous half an outfit I've ever seen. It's kind of hard to be emotionally invested in her plight when she nobly sacrifices herself to save the rest of the group and the camera pans around to her ass cheeks just hanging out of her booty shorts. Do people actually want Rex in Smash Brothers, or do they just want Pyra's chest in Smash Brothers? It was at this point in the game when I realized I might not be this game's target audience. But really it was right at this point. Now place your hand on my chest. In game design, when making a sequel, you don't want to just appeal to your current audience, you also want to expand out to a new audience with each game. But I don't think that should come at the expense of alienating your current fans who have supported you up to this point. I might think these designs were good if I was a teenager, and I get the fantasy aspect of it, but as an adult who gets rejected by real women on Tinder, it just seems kind of odd. But you know, Pyra is just one character in the game. Pretty soon you get two more girls on your team, Nia and Poppy join your party. And at least they don't have over-sexualized designs, right? 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 Oh my god! What the fuck? The over-sexualized designs of Nia and Poppy. So Nia the cat girl starts in like a jumpsuit, but then halfway through the game she reveals her true form, whose design gets a big ol' what from me. That pussy can barely contain her pussy. And here's a question. Why does the happy little robot girl transform into a busty maid and then again into a cyborg stripper? All three of these women power up through the course of the game by taking their clothes off. Does this game intend for you to be fully erect at all times? If playing Xenoblade 2 for 4 hours or more, consult a doctor IMMEDIATELY. I'm just not completely sure how the female characters in the Xenoblade games went from this to this to this? I feel like you skipped a couple steps there. Now you could make the argument that, for Poppy and Nia, their, uh, transformations fit their character arcs, with Poppy growing into more of an adult, and Nia not needing to hide her true self anymore. But with stories, there's two types of analysis to keep in mind. The Watsonian, which is, what's the in-story reason for this? And the Doyleist, which is, why did the story writer do this? With Poppy and Nia, the Watsonian reason for their designs might sort of fit their character arcs, but the Doyleist reasons for their designs are, sex sells, we wanted to sell more video games. And I already know some people are saying, Well, in Xenoblade 1, you could take their clothes off. And in Xenoblade X, you could wear bikinis over your armor. And both game had its fair share of pretty suspect armor designs. But yeah, you could choose to do that. Xenoblade 2 does not have alternate outfits. There's a big difference between horny players can choose to put the girls in ridiculous outfits and this is the default and only character design. The default is how the game is meant to be played. But that's only for three of the blades, right? It's not like the rest of the female blades in this game look like this. Oh, come the fuck on! The over-sexualization of damn near every female blade in this game. 
Okay, this is just way too much. To all of you who say, This is the same as the previous games. That is the biggest false equivalency I've ever heard. This series went from like 30% horny to 300% horny. You cannot sit here and honestly tell me that these are the same. I see no difference. And yeah, I love how like all the female blades are designed to appeal to a different fetish. It's just like cat girls, fox girls, weeaboo girls, church girls, bunny girls, big titty goth girls, milf, sex in a bath tub, roller derby, hand job, blow job, bestiality, trap, domination, lollycon, 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 sexy librarian, sexy secretary, sexy robot girl, storm from x-men, very foreign girls, necrophilia, uh, vor? Almost every female blade is either half naked or a titty monster. They all look like shitty gotcha game characters. So I guess the design is actually pretty accurate. This is not what comes to mind when I think of the direct sequel to the story of Shulkin Pals. This character design is just the game designer saying, Well, we don't have much to offer in terms of gameplay, so here's some half naked girls to look at at least. Xenoblade 2 is what I like to refer to as a titty game. There's nothing inherently wrong with making a titty game or playing a titty game. You don't see me making a video series complaining about, I don't know, Gal Gun or Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball because they're titty games. You're not playing it for the good gameplay. You're there to see half-naked girls shake their genitals. And that's what Xenoblade 2 is. All fan service, no substance. There's a difference between having some fan service in your game and fan service being the focus of the game. And it's, I don't know, a little disappointing considering that one and X were the best RPGs on their respective consoles, and I personally, in general, don't play titty games. And look, I get it, alright? Game design is hard and takes a long time. You don't want all the time you spent on your game to be wasted, so you're gonna do whatever it takes to make your game stand out from other ones. There's more games than ever before. You ever been on the Switch eShop? There's like 5,000 fucking games on there, and most of them are garbage. So one way to make your game stand out is to put cute girls in it, I guess. And there's nothing inherently wrong with putting a bunch of cute girls in your game. But considering that this was the Switch's first big original mega RPG on the system, published by Nintendo themselves, was this really necessary for its success? Well, maybe. But I don't think it's a hot take to say that character design should fit the character. Mario's a plumber, he looks like a plumber, it's simple. But in Xenoblade 2, none of the Blades' appearances match their personalities. There's a great video by Ludishkeri? about Xenoblade 2 and sexualization that does a way better job than I could do explaining it. But what I will say is that maybe if you're going to have a sexy character, maybe make it fit the character? I mentioned Bayonetta earlier as an example of sexualization done well. Well, another example I'll talk about is Primrose from Octopath Traveler. You know, a good game. I'd say that she has a pretty sexy design, I think that's fair. What does she do in the game? She poses as a dancer to woo men to do her bidding and gather information to track down her father's killer. In the context of the story, she's wielding her sexuality. If you go out to the club, you see a lot of women wearing sexy outfits, right? Because they're expressing their own sexuality. The agency of it lies within themselves. It's their choice. But I don't get that sense from Pyra or Mithra or any of these over-sexualized characters. Instead, I get the sense that we objectified a whole gender to sell more games. At least that's what I see. Thanks for watching. Leave a comment if you agree or disagree with me. I'm just one person with one opinion, so it'll be better to hear other people's opinions as well. Like the video if you liked the video, and remember to subscribe so you get notified about the next part, where I'll be talking about things such as what I actually like about the game, and also why this shitty gotcha game mechanic is dumb as hell.